Welcome to the Bygot News for you. I'm Alexander Armstrong. In the news this week, there's embarrassment for David Cameron as footage emerges of some of those 70,000 Syrian ground troops in training. <laughs> In Moscow, as he meets his next opponent, Russia's number one judo star starts to think he may have to throw the fight. <laughs> and home movie footage of a kitchen in Essex in the 1970s shows a career-defining moment in the life of Victoria Beckham. Anya's team tonight is a comedian who is about to publish her first book, which is described as a funny exploration of the female body. I've done one of those. <laughs> Please welcome Sarah Pascoe! <laughs> and we're called tonight as a Scottish politician who led the SNP for over 20 years, up until 2014. And then they got popular. Please welcome <laughs> Alex Hammond, MSP, MP. And we start, as ever, with the bigger stories of the week. Paul and Alex, take a look at this. Yes. This is obviously the bombing of Syria is beginning. Uh, this is the, the many people who are against it. This is Shadow Cabinet. So mm -hmm. ruining a snooker match. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that's a, a Daesh tank going round in circles. So that should be pretty easy to bomb that one. But uh, <laughs> I hope other targets are as well. A uh, big debate. The uh, government got a, a big majority for bombing a city. Yeah, you got it in one. Any mm. good speeches by anyone? There was uh, a lot of good speeches. It was, uh, Any it was Scottish a... politicians shine? The... <laughs> <laughs> All Scottish politicians shine, but the... It's the, the debate. debate, the debate. <laughs> Who gave the most impressive performance, would you say, in the debate? The speaker. Actually, yes. Because he didn't go to the toilet for 11 hours. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a special arrangement. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like astronauts. Yeah, like exactly. Very similar, very similar arrangement. A lot, a lot of tubing. What, under all the breaches and the underneath, buckles? Underneath, underneath, through the House of Lords, through the canteen, up through Big Ben, back again. <laughs> It's an 11 hour cycle, so after 11 hours, you've got to get out of there. <laughs> you don't blow back, do you? <laughs> exactly. Indeed. Do you think there were people who made their minds up in the chamber on the night? Well, they were forecasting a big majority, right? And then as the debate started, and particularly with Cameron talking about Corbyn as a, a terrorist sympathiser. Mm -hmm. He was speaking of his wavering, his wavering backbenchers, saying you don't want to walk through the lobby with Jeremy Corbyn and a bunch yeah, of look, terrorists. Uh, yes. Uh, so but, that, that is actually smearing everybody who came out yeah. against the war. That's a good yeah. start. Mm. Yeah. He was challenged on it a number of times. It was a, a foolish thing for him to say, but, but it was tactically daft yeah. because it would stiffen the resolve of some Labour MPs, you would have thought. Uh, there's one Machiavellian theory about that the, the Tories briefed that so that the question of the 70,000 bogus battalions, as, well, as one uh, Tory MP called it, wouldn't be examined. Oh, they're not that clever. Well, <laughs> they well, deliberately make two enormous howlers thinking, oh, the lesser one will get all the no. attention. So, so, yeah, that was David Cameron's big 40, that was his 45 minute moment, they're saying, isn't it? Well, that was the exact quote from the, the, the Tory MP. He said, we had a dodgy dossier and now we've got uh, bogus battalions. Right, and the 70,000 claim was challenged by lots of MPs, obviously, mm. including the SNP's Angus Robertson. I, I've got to, he is very impressive, isn't he? Mm. He is, yes, he is. Let, He's, I mean, a big. <laughs> Scottish man, capable. He's so impressive. He's a leader, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. He, oh. Absolutely. <laughs> Angus <Wright. laughs> You were there on Wednesday, because obviously the, the previous debate on the 26th of November, you, uh, you had to miss that, didn't you? Because you were... Uh, you were unveiling a portrait. Uh, which, uh, incidentally, uh, raised 50,000 quid for charity. It's a good portrait. It's uh, a, we've oh, got I a picture. Feel I've got bad now. Portrait. Go on. It was no. for charity. <laughs> what, what are you doing to that sofa? <laughs> 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 The next Scottish National Portrait Gallery is a wonderful place. Slightly haunting, the, the Och Eyes follow you around the room. <laughs> <laughs> have you been there? Um, I have, yeah. Oh, That's very beautiful. Is your portrait there? Uh, it's not. Uh, I'll give it time. No, I'll give it a little You'll be all right. Paint anybody, do they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a pavement yeah. artist just outside. Oh, see, yeah. the Did you see there was a Scottish Labour source who said if Alex Salmond was chocolate, he'd eat himself? <laughs> <laughs> there, was a, there was a boy at my school who could do that. <laughs> The other argument David Cameron uh, put forward is that the Allied forces need our particular smart technology. What's all that about? Well, th this is the, the Brimstone missile, which uh, David Cameron's been arguing for uh, weeks uh, is unique to the RAF uh, until uh, another Scottish MP pointed out that uh, we'd sold them to the Saudi Arabians uh, some months back. So they have them as well. Yeah, but they're not going to use them, are they? <laughs> <laughs> the missiles now are all named rather sort of callously. Mm. The drones are called Reaper. Mm. Yes, yeah. sort of tells you what they do. <laughs> Hellfire. Hellfire, oh, yeah, brimstone. Yeah. Bit camp, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, what happened to some brimstone missiles recently? Ah, you, you've got me. They uh, fell off. Look, yeah. look, they're smart enough to get back on again. <laughs> <laughs> How 
is Jeremy Corbyn's week gone? At first, I think he tried to argue to get the Labour Party to, to vote against, you know, to, uh, have a whipped sort of vote. But then, you know, somebody pointed out, really, when it comes to matters of conscience, he says, must be, really, whether you're sending people to war or not, it has to be a free vote. So that's basically how it turned out. So he didn't get the Labour MPs behind him, necessarily. And uh, Hillary Benn made a very good speech. And some people are saying, oh, well, Hillary Benn might be a bit of a contrast to Jeremy Corbyn, maybe, but a leadership election sometime, you know, rivalry, maybe in a year or so. Uh, how much do you want? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> uh, you summed it up yeah, entirely. Not, but you've had a bit of a run-in with Hillary, haven't you? I was doing a contrast between Tony Benn, who made some incredibly powerful anti-war speeches mm. in, in the House of Commons, and Hillary Benn, who made a, a, a pro-war speech on behalf of the Tory Prime Minister. Uh, and I merely said that uh, I thought uh, his uh, father would be bullied in his grave. Now, it's a Scottish idiom, it means a deceased person <laughs> would be surprised at that turn of events. Uh, and I have to say, I think that Tony Benn would be fair astonished. Mm. To have sort of people running around saying, Ben, Tory scum, is new. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Really, isn't it? I mean, that, it's, it's a turnaround. That, that bit wasn't me, you know. You no, 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 I'm just paraphrasing yeah. you. No, that, that's... Uh... <laughs> Who are the two gangs in the Labour rivalry? They're called Momentum, mm -hmm. which is the Corbynite one, and Progress, which what is the like other. Like it's The Apprentice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, they've given them some stupid names. <laughs> There's, uh... <laughs> Look, I mean, I, I've spent a political lifetime uh, fighting the Labour Party, but there is a serious side to this. The, the divisions in the Labour Party gave Cameron a much easier time on Wednesday than they should have had, uh, because much of the, the debate was actually focused about the internal battles in the Labour Party, but it should have been focused on dismantling what was a threadbare case for bombing in Surrey. According to one embattled Labour MP, every day is like opening an advent <laughs> calendar of oh. shit. <laughs> What did one of Corbyn's most loyal supporters, Diane Abbott, do in a, in a shadow cabinet meeting? Light an advent candle. <laughs> <laughs> a bit dangerous. According yeah. to the Sunday Times, Diane Abbott tried to do an impression of shadow education spokesperson Lucy Powell. One source told the Sunday Times she's no Mike Yarwood. The performance was so dire that Corbyn loyalist John Cryer considered voting for bombing just on the basis <laughs> of her contribution. <laughs> What was the former uh, Shadow Education Secretary Tristan Hunt doing when the Labour Party arguments all kicked off on Monday? Well, he was he on the holiday Labour? somewhere? No, he took to Twitter. Oh, yes. He was making his feelings very clear uh -huh. on another uh, fairly major issue. Mm -hmm. uh, it was this. He tweeted, Beyond excited that Stoke-on-Trent is finally going to get a Pizza Express. <laughs> That's his constituency. Pizza Express. <laughs> <laughs> Nigel Farage has been on Jeremy Corbyn's side in this debate, but uh, he's also been, uh, he's been a stumbling block for him elsewhere. Where was that? That's the by-election, uh, I mean, yesterday's by-election. Absolutely. Farage Do we know the result yet, tomorrow? No. <laughs> <laughs> but political circles are still a buzz at extraordinary result. Yeah. I mean, no one predicted that. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yes, Farage said of Corbyn, his days as Labour leader are numbered. Why is that a problem? Nice, just quit and reappoint yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but before the debate got going properly, um, what did the Conservatives stick the boot into? Jeremy Corbyn. Before the debate got going, Jeremy Corbyn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just before, yeah, no, it, um, it was the BBC. Do you know oh, why? Yeah, that, I mean, that, well, yeah, that's the only thing I agree with the Conservatives on. The, the Conservatives were arguing that uh, we should now, after we just call ISIS Daesh, yeah. uh, which uh, I, I think we should. Uh, because that's the mocking acronym that's used in the Arabic world. Uh, but there are, of course, some, some concerns are, are so, so want to attack the BBC that uh, it's not enough just to say, well, we should all be calling it Daesh. It's to say, and the BBC are not calling it Daesh yet, which proves that the BBC is a conspiracy. A almost terrorist sympathiser. Terrorist sympathiser, almost as bad as... Because the BBC, Trump. rigidly, they call it so-called Islamic State, don't they? It's really confusing for old people if they keep just changing the name all the time, and isn't that why it basically... Yeah, that's what they say about biscuits, though. <laughs> <laughs> Do they keep changing biscuits all the time? All the time. Bastard. <laughs> and Daesh don't like being called Daesh at all, do they? So, so that's why people think that we should be, like that's going to hurt their feelings. Yeah. <laughs> and are we saying it right? It's Daesh. 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 Mm -hmm. So Daesh. it's kind of like what Sean Connery plays backgammon. Yeah, right? yeah. It's Sean, that's like that. <laughs> Daesh. <laughs> Why is a little girl in Australia desperate for the name to change to Daesh? Her name is Isis. Her name is Isis? Yes, of course. Oh, pretty name. Yes, pretty name. She's five years old, yes. and uh, Nutella have refused to personalise a jar of Nutella for her, like they have with other kids. Genocide and Pogrom, for example. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to cheer us up, let's have a look at some slightly better international news. This is for match point, I think. Oh, look, look at that long. Look, look at that. Oh. Yeah. 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 Yeah, really. Are. A British team. 
winning the Davis Cup for the first time since 1936. And it's a great triumph for British sports, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I think... Uh... Yeah. Also Andy Murray and uh, Jamie Murray and uh, uh, Andy and Jamie and... Uh... <laughs> So basically, Dunblane won the Davis Cup. <laughs> yes, the British win then. <laughs> Shall we remind ourselves of the glory days? Yeah. There we are. <laughs> Cameron doesn't look too pleased. Do you think? He, I mean, you think he's, he's just won Wimbledon? You think he'd be delighted? It's a rather shady figure behind him in the dark glasses. Isn't well, it? That's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> what him? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, don't broadcast that. Yeah, this is the news that Britain is now at war, just a few hundred yards across from where we were already at war. Dozens of MPs who were initially against airstrikes in Syria ended up voting in favour. Still, they're not the first people to have changed their minds on the way to Damascus. <laughs> Leading Labour's pro-bombing faction was Hillary Benn, whose father Tony was president of the Stop the War Coalition. Just goes to show, if you call your son Hillary, he will reject everything you stand for. <laughs> Ian and Sarah, take a look at this. I think that's mm -hmm. Conservative headquarters. Oh, I see. There's some young Tories. I see. Oh. Aged oh. about 50. I've got some lanyards. Oh, look, it's Michael Green. Oh, no. Uh oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which one's the one that you swipe if you don't like them on Tinder? <laughs> You're asking the wrong person. Yeah. <laughs> it's just Grinder for me. <laughs> <laughs> they had a horrible situation where uh, a young member of their party committed suicide, which was terribly sad, but then now, afterwards, everyone's blaming everybody else. Yes. Yeah, so this yeah. is the Young Conservatives, who young conservatives. have been revealed as being ghastly, which was a huge shock to everyone, you can imagine. Because <laughs> uh, obviously everybody thought they were nice, moderate, um, yeah. well-balanced young men. <laughs> and, they, and, women, and women. And women. And women. But it's mostly the men who are doing the, the bullying. But who is at the centre of this, of this controversy? It's oh, a man called Clark. Yes. And Mark he, Clark. Mark Clark. Yes, there are claims that he blackmailed ministers. He, yeah. He sexually harassed his sort of co-workers. Yeah. I mean, a, a, allegedly, I have to point out, Mark Clark has denied all these allegations. Mm. What's yeah. the name that they're all going by? These these young Tories. There's a, oh, Tatler Tories. The ta do you know why? The Tatler predicted that this man Clark would one day be in the cabinet. That's right. There was and an the Tatler's well known for spotting political leaders. Sounds <laughs> <laughs> stupid. What is the Tatler? It's uh, a, magazine a magazine for knobs. <laughs> They had an article in 2008, mm. um, and they, they, they picked out ten young Tories who they reckoned were tipped for greatness. Here we've got a photograph of Mark Clark. There he is. That's him, second from the left. Is the woman standing in front of him, is she saying to him, will you please stop pumping air up my sleeve? <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't know what he's doing it with, but she knows it's happening. <laughs> if she's actually just got a really, really fat lower arm, you're going to feel awful. <laughs> is that that pop <laughs> She's got an anchor on there. Is her dad Popeye? She'll be on the notes. If her dad is Popeye, it'll be on the notes. It doesn't say. It can't be. Can't be her dad. Can't be her dad. Oh, Camilla the Sailor Man. You're absolutely <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what was Mark Clark doing? What was his official role? He organised these road trips. That's right. Oh. Of volunteers to drum up support for the Tory party. Exactly. Oh. The trouble about young Tory party is it's so low level. It's literally young men going around saying, you will never work on the back desk of the Assistant Conservative Research Department ever again. <laughs> And everyone goes, ooh, no. So they go very camp when they're they fighting. are. <laughs> <laughs> one of Clark's techniques is a thing called IIP. Does anyone know what that is? Intimidate, interrogate, party. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> fun at the end of the day. <laughs> if only it was that. Oh. It's his technique for using alcohol to lure women. You're joking. And he calls it isolate, inebriate, and penetrate. <laughs> Theresa May stop those people coming into the country now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we have rules on this? Oh. Former Tory co-chairman Grant Chaps has had to resign. Why particularly did he have to resign? Well, he was supposedly in charge of, of these young people not bullying each other. And there have been calls for Lord oh, Feldman exactly. Lord to resign. But Grant Chaps had, had, had ignored repeated allegations. And he was on the coach with them, was he? Well, he'd, he appointed Driving him in 2014, I think, to run these road trips. But he'd ignored all these, uh, all these allegations that had been presented to him. What prompted the resignation? Was it Tatler again? No, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's Baroness Wasi, another former chairman of the Tory party. She helpfully produced a letter revealing her complaint about Clark to Shaps in January. She said he was always a disaster waiting to happen, and this was common knowledge. That was the end of her letter, whinging about something else, though. Well, when she I mean, I just want to spread the yes. blame around a bit. 
it wasn't the principal no. point of her letter, no. which made her case less impressive. I see, but she also um, she took Mark Clark off the candidates list, yes. off the A list for candidates, um, and he responded with a smear campaign in which he called her a terrorist sympathiser. <laughs> <laughs> there's, uh, there's a lot of that going about, isn't there? Perfect. That's where Cameron got his idea then, <laughs> from Grant Schnapps. <laughs> Grant Schnapps. Schnapps. <laughs> I called, him, I called him Grant Snaps by mistake once, so it's a habit I've got. Mm. Now I'm doing it deliberately. Uh, but now there's been an inquiry. What was wrong with that? Well, they were going to have an inquiry um, led by Lord Feldman. Yes. Um, and given that he was meant to be inquiring into himself, anything wrong, old boy? No, nothing at all. Um, <laughs> that didn't go very far. But it should be OK because uh, the brilliantly named Lord Panic has, uh, <laughs> has been put in charge of the <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know he comes in in his robes. <laughs> OK, and finally, on the subject of political activists, who'd like to see an Irish government minister being questioned by an activist in Dublin? Yes, please. This, week. this was Andy Whelan from the Le Revolutionary Republic News questioning Irish Trade Minister <coughs> Joe Costello over water charges. Just ignore what he said and just keep on walking. How is that there? I haven't heard you either, you know, you're fucking <laughs> This is the bullying scandal involving Mark Clark, the Tatler Tory. After his behaviour during the 2010 election campaign, a lengthy dossier mm. compiled for Tory HQ said of Mark Clark, he didn't seem to know the difference between right and wrong, with a note in the margin adding, future cabinet minister? Question mark? <laughs> One of Mark Clark's colleagues on the 2015 road trip campaign was the recently ennobled Baroness Emma Pidding. Emma Pidding. I wonder if she's one of the Yorkshire Piddings. <laughs> And so to round two, the strengthometer of news, things on Buzz's teams. Here's the first one. <laughs> oh, brains. Yes, Men buzzer. and women's brains. Yes, buzzer. Oh, buzzers. Uh, Ian and Sarah. Brains. <laughs> Men and women's brains. Yes. Men and women, Men and women all have brains. And so there's this... this <laughs> I was just thinking that your brain didn't think about pressing the buzzer and his did, no, which is very annoying. Yes, but my brain did get it right! Yes! Okay! Look, the, the, this is a story that says that men and women's <laughs> brains... <laughs> the brains are essentially the same. So women are from Mars and men are from Venus, whatever it was. That's just all. That was just a book. Yep. Not true at all. Uh, the only difference is that the men can understand buzzers quicker than women. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> only one. And it's very tiny. It's, it's a tiny, tiny brain. According to Mail, science, scientists analysed brain scans of more than 1,400 men and women and found that while the odd person will have an all-male Mars or all-female Venus brain, the majority will have one somewhere between the two. In other words, most brains are intersex. What is a, what is a, what is a male brain and what is a female brain? It's, How does that happen? Well, that's the thing. That, another thing that's quite sexist is that they will say spatial mm. and reasoning male brain. Mm. That, so, that if, so even the way that they treat brains is very sexist. There's an amazing book called The Gender Delusion, which is all about sexism in, how, in brain studies, and it's brilliant. And what is most prevalent is that they often do these studies, find no results, and they're not published. So for everyone that's in the Daily Mail, there's 100 that found no difference. Professor Joel, who's the author of the study, yeah. uh, according to Professor Joel, the study did show that if you looked at a brain, you could predict better than evens what the sex of the person would be. But it is much easier to look at <laughs> <the genders. laughs> The other interesting thing is actually now with gender, genitals isn't a sign of someone's gender anymore either. So actually, I think oh, this yeah. Dr. Joel's an idiot. <laughs> and I know he's got a very good qualification and I can't use buzzers, but... I think it's I just, it's, she's it. a female, Doctor. You, oh, you uh, just I was fall so in <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> In other news, what facial feature might make men more sexist? It's going to be something to do with facial hair and it's testosterone. A yeah, it's a beard. Yeah. An Australian study uh, this week found that men with facial hair were more likely to show signs of macho behaviour and a tendency to degrade women. There was this other theory earlier this year where people said that more men were growing beards in a response to women wanting more power. So that they were asserting, oh, um, look what I can grow. <laughs> on the, uh, on the, when they were... <laughs> I don't see much evidence here. These people are not cool, trendy people. <laughs> I said it in a jokey way. You know what I meant. <laughs> right, let's get her. <laughs> when the not cool and trendy. 
<laughs> when the Daily Star covered this story, who did they feature uh, the, to illustrate? The, As the bearded, the bearded sexist man? Yes. Corbyn. <laughs> Below <laughs> women at the top of the shadow cabinet, it all makes sense. Yeah. No, the newly bearded Prince Harry, and of course, Abu Hamza. <laughs> Uh, what fashion trend might help soften the macho bravado of these, uh, these chauvinists this time of year? The man bun. The what? The man... The man, the man bun. bun. What is the man bun? I didn't wear mine tonight. Didn't you? <laughs> it's when um, men have quite a lot of long hair, yes. but they wear it up. Actually, very similar to this. It's like that. I see. And man. you didn't wear yours tonight, Ian? I didn't, no. Because I didn't want to, you know, make the audience feel uncool and trendy. <laughs> The must-have accessory for this Christmas is glitter beards. Glitter Ooh. beards? Yeah. <laughs> On the subject of Christmas, yes. uh, what are five poor student paramedics used to make their Christmas tree with this week? Student paramedics? Not, not, not bones or anything, is it? No. It's, it's not it's, body parts. It's this. It's, it, it's gloves. <laughs> well, that's uh, really it's rather good. Yeah. Right. Artistic. If that was Vets, I'd find it very creepy. Because oh. it looks like loads of udders. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. But they're just checking that no people don't have that kind of stuff. Or the hands of undead souls escaping the spirit of Christmas. <laughs> that'll, ruin the, that'll ruin the tree for anybody if you thought of that. <laughs> uh, this is a scientific study that has discovered there are no real differences between male and female brains. According to the Daily Mail, the male brain tends to withstand pain better than the female brain. Yes, I remember when my wife was giving birth and she squeezed my hand so tightly. I didn't say a word. <laughs> <laughs> Is it true you remember your birth? <laughs> no, I don't. You don't? No, I don't. I, no, it's interesting. I, I vaguely... Re I reckon I have memories of being in the womb. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> I think we probably all do. So why would we have think... memories of you being in the womb? <laughs> <laughs> You're not that big a personality. That we all grow up thinking, oh, I don't know how that godson's doing in the womb. So what were your memories like? Then? What, what I, just, I just have a vague sort of warm. sensory what? memory of warm. <laughs> you know, it's rare in Northumberland, where yeah. I'm from. Um, no, I've just sort of... Um, a slightly it. wet, rubbery sort of. <laughs> I just haven't had this salad, Alexander. No, I just, I genuinely, there's a sort of sensory memory I have. The inside of your mother was made of wet rubber. <laughs> yes. Right. Fingers on buzzers, team. <laughs> yes. Golfers are getting confused. <laughs> Because Brussels sprouts have become genetically engineered to be exactly the same weight and size as a golf ball. It's super sprouts. It is super sprouts. It is super sprouts. It is super sprouts. Super sprouts. Yes. Nobody knows how to control them. A sprout getting bigger. like that could take over the world. They're getting... Exactly. These are monster sprouts. Monster sprouts the... on the market. They grow legs, we're in trouble. Why are they so big? Because they're massive. <laughs> they're great big buggers. And they don't care who knows it. They were um... bitten by a radioactive tortoise and they've grown hugely. <laughs> or just a warm August. A warm August. A warm August. Oh, August yeah. The most deadly of all foes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, who's this, who is this bad news for? Obviously. Little sprouts. <laughs> <laughs> the runner beans done a runner. <laughs> Come out of here. Who is it bad news is, for? For children, obviously. Why is it bad news for because children? they don't like sprouts. Well, you don't have to eat them then. Well, no, also because these this are more normally than... large sprouts. Yeah. They'll, they'll measure 40 millimetres wide, yeah. 45 millimetres long, yes. which is larger than the average child's mouth. But well, you could cut them up. Yeah. <laughs> We've got a sprout comparison chart here to make things a bit clearer. There we are. Okay. They're monsters. What do we have to thank? Global warming. Global warming. According to the independents, experts say the unusually warm weather this autumn had seen sprouts grow an extra 20% larger. Speaking of climate change, yes. um, how have world leaders been tackling the issue? In Paris. They have indeed. Mm -hmm. They're going to limit global warming, if they can, to 2 degrees centigrade this century. So mm. it's, it's pretty much all, all sorted. Which is great. <laughs> uh, who was representing Britain there? Who was helping to represent Britain, I should say? At the David Cameron conference? and Prince Charles. Prince Charles, yeah. They were both there. Here's Prince Charles showing how passionate he is on the issue. I'm going to write you a letter if you're not careful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, apart from climate change, what was Prince Charles worried about? Getting home. No. <laughs> he, was, he told scientists that he feared for the future of French cheese. He said, in a microbe-free, progressive and genetically engineered future, what hope is there for the old-fashioned fond d'Ambert, mm. the malformed Gruyère de Comté and the odorous Pont l'Evêque? Wow. Your Highness, you had me at fond <laughs> John Snow cancelled a meeting with Prince Charles at the conference. What was the reason for that? Uh, Prince Charles had a 15-page memorandum which he hands to the broadcasters, the things you can and cannot do, you can, uh, cannot and can't ask them about. And uh, they said, well, in that circumstance, we won't interview you then. Absolutely right. Mm. So, uh, Channel 4 described it as North Korea-style control methods by Clarence House. Yeah, it was a list of questions they couldn't ask. Are you looking forward to anyone dying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, the son mocked up Charles as King Jong-un. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who had a heartwarming historic handshake at the conference? Heartwarming historic. 
there was uh, the Israeli and Palestinian leaders, oh, right. Netanyahu and Abbas, shared a handshake. What, what soured at the moment? What? Occupation of Palestine? Uh, <laughs> no, just <laughs> as the... Uh, <laughs> Just as the historic moment was happening, the president of Comoros, uh, Ikelulu Dawanini, got in the way of the camera, so the only official photograph of the historic handshake looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> Time now for the odd one out round. Ian and Sarah, your four are Ooh. Rachel Dolezal, La Bella Principessa, Sarah and Zach from DWP, and Margaret Thatcher's High Heels. Well, the only one I really know very much about is Rachel Dillazelle. She was that woman who says that she was black when she's not. She's completely of white heritage. So could this be something to do with Faking race? it, because this is a, a portrait which is meant to be an old master, but a man said I painted it, um, and it's the face of a girl from Tesco. OK, and these guys? They're from Department of Work, Work and Pensions. Pensions. Do you remember there was a case where the DWP gave you guidelines and they said, these people, for example, oh, yes, are real-life stories. And they mm. weren't, they made it up. So this is to do with faking things. So um, Margaret Thatcher's shoes are real. The shoes are real. used to being fake. I bet they're, they're not, though. Yes, that's the right answer. No! <laughs> Uh, they're all false identities, apart from Maggie Thatcher's high heels, which were involved in a case of mistaken identity. Ooh. They were mistaken for high-grade weapons. <laughs> what? <laughs> she, Who by? Wayne, well, where? by Russian security. She'd been in Russia and she yes. went to some funeral and it was so cold, yeah. they lent her some boots and fur coat or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Away, and in the, her high heels were then put in the pockets of her security oh, detail. The and the Russian security thought that they were packing some kind of heat. Yeah. She went to Russia without a coat. <laughs> <laughs> That seems to be the long and the short of it. Was yes. there no sort of foreign office report that it was cold that time of year in Russia? Oh. Uh, what else has Lady Thatcher been up to this week? Not much. Not much. <laughs> well, <laughs> she was voted the most influential woman of all time and the most influential woman in Scottish politics for 200 years. <laughs> how, how has Nicola taken that news, I wonder? Well, uh, she was the most influential woman in Scottish politics because she drove Scotland towards independence, that's why. <laughs> so Nicola's yeah, the well, I never expected that as an answer. Yeah. There so La Bella Principessa, you are absolutely right, is the co-op rather than Tesco's, oh. but other people oh, pretty much right, every well, year. I'm not paid by them, so for me it's Tesco. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, convicted forger Sean Greenhosh claimed that he, rather than Leonardo da Vinci, had painted La Bella Principessa. It's beautiful, isn't it? The painting has been valued at £100 million, plus 5p for the bag. <laughs> Greenhouse claimed that it was a girl called Sally who used to work at his local co-op store in Bolton. Sean said, despite her humble position, she was a bossy little bugger and very self-important. <laughs> She's been painted by Leonardo da Vinci. It's going to go to someone's head. <laughs> no. uh, Sarah and Zach, you got that? Zach and, Zach and Zach and Sarah. I thought you'd forgotten Ian's name then for a second. <laughs> <laughs> is that your nickname? You yeah, are Zach. I'm mostly known as Zach. <laughs> <laughs> they appeared as case studies on leaflets produced by mm. the Department of Work yeah. and Pensions, uh, talking about the positive experiences of the welfare system. Uh, Rachel Dolezal, American civil rights activist and university lecturer, stepped down earlier this year as president of the chapter of the National Association of the Advancement of Coloured People after admitting she was actually white. How is her false identity blown? Her parents. Absolutely right, yeah. Her they parents, were a bit cross. Well, they gave an interview and they revealed that Rachel had chosen to represent herself as an African-American woman or a biracial person, and that's simply not true. How did uh, Rachel respond to her parents? Slammed the door and ran out of her bedroom. Pretty much. She said, I don't give two shits what you guys think. <laughs> <laughs> that's what happened. Yeah. Um, <laughs> staying with fake identities, also this week a robbery was carried out by two crooks wearing panda onesies. <laughs> the thieves held up a news agents and demanded cash from the till. Ching Ching was waiting outside <laughs> in the getaway car. The robbery went smoothly until the pandas saw the sign on the newsagent's door saying no more than two children, at which point the pandas looked at each other and burst into tears. <laughs> sad, but sad. Paul and Alex, here are yours. Farmer Ben Fletcher's sweet potato, Geminoid F, Kellogg's cornflakes, and John Prescott's office. Yeah, I, I think this. Uh, I think this is about sex, basically. About sex. Yeah, because Geminoid F is a sex robot. I've heard. I've been told. I've, <laughs> I, I, I read somewhere. I, I saw it on television. Something like that. Anyway, yeah. Farmer Ben Fletch is. He, he's the farmer who keeps unearthing sensuous potatoes. Sensuous <laughs> potatoes. Yeah, sensuously shaped. Your knowledge potatoes. about this is disturbingly <laughs> thorough. And I think the office is where John Prescott uh, had sex. Yeah. With, with, a lampshade. Temple. <laughs> with a lampshade. With a lampshade. With a lampshade. And it was revealed uh, that uh, Kellogg, the originator of cornflakes, was anti-sex. Because people had cornflakes in the morning instead of having sex. Therefore, all the other fear about sex, except cornflakes, I suggest it's cornflakes. You, listen, that's amazing. Yeah. 
It's like watching a Scottish Columbo. Was it? Because you went through each of the facts yeah. one by one, and then I deduce. Oh. It was brilliant. If you, if you wait long enough in the programme, you get onto your specialist subject. <laughs> Since you're on potatoes. <laughs> Dr John Harvey Kellogg and his brother Will came up with the cornflake recipe yes. as they believed that plainer foods helped cleanse the body and mind of erotic desires. Uh -huh. Though there was an unfortunate misunderstanding early in the marketing process when he asked a designer to put a massive cock on the cereal packet. <laughs> <laughs> what was Dr Kellogg's novel approach to eating yoghurt? Did you hear about that? No. He believed that after administering your morning enema, a pint of yoghurt should be consumed half through the mouth and half through the anus. <laughs> It's the expression, mmm, done on. <laughs> You're actually right about Ben Fletch as well. He found a sweet potato vegetable so sexy he couldn't bring himself to eat it. What was so sexy about this vegetable? Boobies? Was it have boobies on it? No, but according to the mirror, it bore a striking resemblance to someone with a rather shapely behind bending over. There it is. <laughs> What did Fletch do with it instead? <laughs> did he give it a good fork in? <laughs> he told reporters, we threw it away as I didn't want to cook it. <laughs> threw it away. <laughs> it's in his special drawer. In his chair, <laughs> it? According to The Sun, John Prescott's old government office was destroyed this summer to stop officials being distracted by thoughts of the former deputy PM's romps. But to be honest, the sofa they used was pretty much destroyed at the time. <laughs> John Prescott told the press, I admit that I've acted stupidly and caused great distress to my wife and family. And then they found out about his affair. <laughs> um, Gemini Def. Now, listen, it's not a sex robot. Just a robot. No. I mean, it's I've just got, a robot. I've, yeah. I've Where's the sex robot coming yeah. from? Yeah. It was a wild guess. I've got no specialist knowledge of this. <laughs> <laughs> Here she is. sexy about that. <laughs> it's, it's been dubbed the world's sexiest robot. Yeah. But who voted it the world's sexiest robot? People. <laughs> um, in other sexy inanimate object <laughs> news, what's the criticism of a new German building called the Domesticator? Uh, it, the, the, the way the sunlight hits it at around about three o'clock in the afternoon beams into the back of people's brains and they, they have orgasms. Oh, Great news for the people of Berlin. <laughs> Let's have a look at the Domesticator. <laughs> Of course. I don't get it. <laughs> when Lego goes wrong, I know. Yeah. I was nearer than I thought. Lego over. <laughs> Lego. <laughs> Time now for the missing words round, which this week features as its guest publication, Pest, the independent UK <laughs> pest management magazine. Then we start with: Is it an insult to call someone what? Uh, the vest charges. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's, is it an insult to call someone Gollum? Oh, yes! Yeah. Oh, President Erdogan yeah. of yes. Turkey yeah. is prosecuting someone who claimed he looks like Gollum. From <laughs> <laughs> and that is the case for the prosecution. <laughs> <laughs> Next, Australian politician's son, what in family Christmas card? Oh, yeah. flicking the V sign. Uh, <laughs> it's assault. So that's a young lad who wouldn't be in the Christmas card, so they went ahead and he's, he's about six feet away. <laughs> <laughs> right. You can get yeah, Australian upset. politician's son is a delightful little Scrooge. Australian oh. Labour politician Andrew Lee's family Christmas card went viral this week after one of his kids was featured on the card sulking. <laughs> <laughs> Next, Tony Blair tried to what and he was really dire. Try to chat up sex robot with sexy potato. <laughs> Fancy a spud. <laughs> to conceal his wealth after he left office, <laughs> mostly in offshore funds in strange tax havens and... Essentially, he was really dire. It's a stand-up comedy. Absolutely right. He tried to make it as a stand-up, stand and he was really dire. Tony Blair said in an interview this week that... At least only he died. <laughs> <laughs> Tony Blair said in an interview this week that his attempts at being a comedian were truly dire. According to The Guardian, Blair said, you've got to be ruthless about the material if it doesn't go well. Right, right, if it doesn't go well, you can just order another dossier of material. <laughs> Uh, next, Manchester building what? And it's driving people nuts. Infested with squirrels. <laughs> I'm digging like a tabloid <laughs> news headline writer. This is a screaming building, isn't it? It is. This, this is a screaming a, building. Yeah, so it's the, it sways in the wind and makes a, a high pitched sound. It is. Yeah, it's like You're that. absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, Manchester building won't stop screaming. <laughs> this is the Beetham Tower in Manchester, which every time the wind picks up, won't stop screaming. Mm -hmm. Sounds annoying, but next week it's hosting loose women. <laughs> uh, let's have a listen. Okay. 
It's like a a symphony, but we can play with it. Okay. It's like a bell symphony, but yeah. Yeah, okay. It's because it sounds like bagpipes. (laughs) (laughs) And finally, Colin McCook chooses prize of £100 worth of bed bug and cockroach traps after winning Pest Magazine's What competition? Only reader. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Guess how many cockroaches are in the picture? Oh. Oh. There you are. This is a blank autocue. This is is From there, you'll have to rely on raw talent. Oh. <laughs> Paris, the, the final scores are Ian and Sarah on six, but Paul and Alex running away with ten. <laughs> but before we go, there's just time for the caption competition. Oh, no. <laughs> Potato found in Green Park. <laughs> On which note, we say thank you to our panellists, Ian Hislop and Sarah Pascoe, Paul Merton and Alex Salmond, MSP MP. And I leave you with news that, as a new training course begins, it's clear Operation Utery has taken its toll. <laughs> In Japan, as the recession worsens, a robot servant is told he's going to have to be let go. And after a repeated public criticism of his leadership, Jeremy Corbyn, along with members of the left unity group, make their way to Hillary Benn's house for clear the air talks. <laughs> Good night.